Hi guys, you have McGee and the Fangirl here, and I'm doing a collab today with Jonathan the PC Genie. Compared to me, he's a huge expert on all the medieval kind of stuff and battles that we see in Game of Thrones. So he's helped me put together a little Q&A today to have some fun with this awesome, awesome show that's coming to an end soon. Now, there is going to be just a little bit of adult language in this video, so if that's something you're not comfortable with, turn away now. So, Jonathan, the Battle of the Bastards was a really intense fight, and you could certainly see the differences between a trained army and the Wildlings conglomerate army. Plus, we had Jon Snow be reborn in blood yet again. But every time I see a fight scene like this, I wonder, how can the two armies really tell each other apart in battle? Everyone looks like they're wearing black and gray in the show, and I don't see many distinctive uniforms, so once you're in the thick of battle and you're this whole group that doesn't really know each other, how do you tell which side is your side and which side is the enemy? I find it especially confusing in scenarios where multiple forces join up to fight for one side because those different little armies that are all together, they don't really know each other. So I would think that the men don't recognize each other in the heat of battle. So tell me, Jonathan, what is the trick that I'm not seeing here to keep your allies from killing each other? So, regarding your question, basically, they told each other apart in battle like this. As you can see, I mean, I normally do historical European martial arts, so the typical sort of brand colours, if you can call them that, are red and black. So, as you can see here, you'd easily tell me apart from others on the battlefield, because if I was representing a particular country, I'd be wearing an outfit, I could have banners, of course, I can have distinct colours, maybe even a sash, other types of clothing items, and you'll see this brigandine armour. No, it's not studded, it's brigandine. These are solid plates underneath. As you can see, this is coloured too, so even items of armour, such as gambesons and brigandine, can be coloured as well as clothing, so that you can distinctly recognise people on the battlefield. You'd sometimes get family insignias and other things that are able to distinctly identify a particular person, but most especially, you could identify someone's nationality from the actual distinct equipment they have, and most especially, colours. And that's why you actually hear of, in the later times, post sort of Cromwell's time in Britain, you have what are called the Redcoats. And it was like that for many hundreds of years. For that very reason, they wore the red coats so that everyone knows that's the British. It's not. It's not necessarily an intimidation tactic, it might work as such. It's not necessarily a matter of pride, even though it could be that as well. The fact of the matter is, if you're on a battlefield and you're pointing a bow, a musket, you've got a sword and you're ready to chop someone to pieces because you're under that much stress, and you can see this person's my friend and that person's my enemy. So, with regards to things like the Battle of the Bastards, I, I really don't know how they told each other apart, to be honest, because they're all in kind of that typical kind of black colour, and sometimes maybe the grey and brown. In reality, if it was like that, you'd be seeing a lot of friendly casualties. Perhaps people would be identifying each other, maybe they might have distinct features, since there was perhaps a bit less interbreeding, you might see someone's skin colour and facial features different, but you don't have that much time to tell a friend from a foe apart. And actually, even more so, a chance of friendly casualties, because of the fact that they did indeed break ranks. Typically, unless you were a very poorly disciplined army, you'd be expected to stay in your ranks, you'd have things like your swords or spears, other items, and you'd be set in your ranks to then engage with an enemy force. And you'd be engaging, you know, front, flanks, back, whatever. You still do it together as a unit. You deliberately rally around your banner. So, to be honest, it's one of the things I have as a complaint against the series. It's, it, it all looks just so slapdash, and the reason you are, you know, you sometimes can struggle to see different armies and find out who's who, is because they don't have those distinct colours. You might be able to tell people like, you know, the sort of people from the north apart from maybe the Unsullied or something like that, when you've got really distinct sorts of sets of armour and distinct equipment, so you can say, okay, that's these guys and that's these guys, so it's them two against each other. At other times, it is just a complete mashup of just anyone smack up anybody. And they probably did that when they were recording a scene, they, you know, with the stunt actors. They wouldn't have been going, okay, so 
you know, this guy's a Lannister and this guy's this. It, it'd just be these two guys are fighting just with swords. So, yeah, they probably they probably would have killed a lot of their friends, to be honest. Thank you, that is so awesome to know. Okay, next question. Several seasons back now, we saw Tywin Lannister come into this village, and he had a bottle full of rats, a torch, and a man's stomach that he used as a torture device. That was absolutely vile, but how historically accurate is a tactic like that? Now, regarding things like torture devices in the medieval period, it's, it's an interesting one. Uh, there's not much information that we've got. We've got plenty of surviving examples of torture devices, but I can't think of any particular instances where someone would do something like the Lannisters did, with, uh, you know, by actually going into a village and having a torture device filled with, you mentioned, sort of fire and bottles and, a bottles and a rat. Doesn't sound familiar at all to any torture device I know of. Mind you, I'm not an expert in such things. It's not quite my area, but I know that Typically, you wouldn't see people sort of doing torture on people. It's, it's, there's an idea about the medieval period being really brutal, but it's really just as brutal in terms of warfare and crime and the rest as many other time periods, really. You'd actually see that, I mean, bearing in mind this was the time when actually even things like trial by ordeal, doing things like scolding the hand and see if it heals fast enough to determine someone's guilt, actually being weaned out in favour of trial by jury. And, you know, you actually see that people, although they would do things like attend public executions, there are plenty of those, especially hanging. Uh, later on, things like the extended version, the hanging, drawing and quartering of a person. And, of course, any person who's a particularly famous character who might be in, you know, such as with King Charles I, would end up getting beheaded in the Renaissance. Those sorts of things are some are things that would be more common, but in terms of torture, there are of course instances where people would be torturing and perhaps even executing by gruesome means people who were thought to be committing treason. But you wouldn't see it wouldn't be very common, as far as we know, to actually get torture equipment and actually bring it out to a village to then you know harass the local villagers. It just it just wouldn't work. Uh, historically, you see instances of people doing things like offering rewards to villagers for you know, giving information, you know, ratting out a particular, maybe a king or someone who's in hiding. There are various instances where villagers have been harassed and you know, have even been attacked and raided you know, with regards to trying to gain a tactical edge like that. But typically, uh, villagers weren't really given that much attention. You'd normally see either people going in and raising the villages for supplies, like standard food and drink and, you know, getting supply lines established, or you'd see them perhaps trying to show dominance with skirmishes to provoke an attack by the forces by a king. Perhaps if they're holed up in a castle, you raid the villages and try to say, come on, come out and fight me, that sort of thing. But torture on villagers, I, I actually can't even think of any instances of that happening without, again, it being something like someone directly being accused of treason. It'd be perhaps a situation like, again, in the race on something like uh, the Guy Fawkes and Robert Catesby and the others. And that was the gunpowder plot. They tried to blow up the House of Parliament. These are people who would have been tortured for further information, and indeed Guy Fawkes was. That's how he gave up the ringleaders, like Robert Catesby, and then they were executed. So... It sounds like something that's an art, to be honest, it sounds a lot like artistic license from Game of Thrones, but, I mean, there's nothing to distinctly say that that wasn't done. There are, of course, situations where you've got people like, quite famously, Vlad the Impaler were known to horrifically torture and execute people, even people who weren't necessarily sort of kings or important people, or who'd done anything, you know, in any specific crime in any specific context, just generally, here's the enemy, I'm going to torture them, but, you know... It's, it's one of those things that's pretty open-ended. There's nothing to say that couldn't have happened, and there's nothing to say it happened all the time, really. So it's kind of, it's a, it's a murky area, so it's one of those things where we've got quite a bit of freedom of regards to, again, artistic license. Oh, that's such a relief to know that the rat bottle thing isn't real. So to change gears a little bit, 
Do you feel that Robert Baratheon made a normal decision for that era when he let the Targaryen children go? It seems to me like it would have been wisest to kill them when they were young and squash any future claims to the throne, which is, of course, what a lot of the series is about. But to be a new monarch and a whole new family in charge, to just exile the previous king's children, it allowed those kids to grow up in a foreign influence that Baratheon couldn't control. Now, when it comes to the decision to let the kids go and essentially exile them, uh, it is actually fairly historically accurate. There have been instances where people, including children, would have been exiled, and especially people like former kings, they would indeed get exiled rather than being executed. It was, it was another mixed bag, to be honest. There were situations where people would be executed, but that was generally, you know, quite frowned upon by the masses. So typically, instead, they would do something like, indeed, exile, especially children, to then, you know, go off to foreign nationals and actually, have, you know, get a noble sort of upbringing there. And quite a few times that would come to sort of bite them in the arse a bit by raising an army and coming back, but actually when you look at it, very few times would that actually be successful. Someone would try to come back as a, a usurper and then would want to maybe raise an army, for, perhaps for example exiled from England, they go over into France, raise a small French army and then try to come over, raise up national support in, you know, in basically to support this usurper and then come back, but very few times would it actually be that successful. Typically, the king who's in power, even if they themselves have usurped the throne by some means, usually they're able to quell any kind of rebellions. Is there a middle ground between exile and murder that would have been a smarter solution here? But, uh, an alternative would also be things like ransom. So, a lot of times you'd see noblemen, especially if you're talking lower noblemen, noblemen not necessarily people who were actual royalty you'd see them being basically ransomed back. So then, of course, you can quite literally get a king's ransom for it. They go back to their original families, carry on, and, you know, in the case of children, they're not an immediate threat. And actually, they can even, you know, needing to raise up children or people who are injured, people with disabilities, they were, whether right or wrong, they were often considered liabilities. So you'd actually see these people returned, and then, of course, people would have to look after them raising up children, looking after people with things like disabilities. It's, it's a situation where it would harm them militaristically, even if it was, in a general sense, perhaps a nice thing to do. And of course, if you do get a large ransom for someone very important, like if you capture and ransom back a king for an ex actual king's ransom, the amount of advantage that they gain from that is significant, because you're not just gaining wealth in a standard sense, you're actually doing it and subtracting the same amount of wealth, of course, from the other side. So you, by the same degree, make your position stronger and their position weaker. So actually, it's one of the things that was quite desirable in Bat and why it might seem cowardly for someone like a king or a very high royalty, you know, sort of royalty sort of person not actually be in the front lines, but if they were captured or killed, it was a significant disadvantage. If they were killed, obviously they can't use any of their power or influence at all, and there's a power vacuum. If they're ransomed back, it's going to be exceptionally expensive, and it is going to hurt. Because they're not just going to ransom back, oh, you know, here, have a bit of gold for your king. It's going to be, we're going to want half your country's treasury. It's that sort of serious death blow that could mean the difference between a war being continued with the support of these powerful characters, and then suddenly, in one blow, it's over. So, I mean, something like Exile, it's, it's realistic, going back to that point, but obviously there are alternatives. If I was in charge, I personally would go for a ransom option, but that's just me. And it is perfectly historically accurate for the children to just instead be you know, exiled off to go elsewhere and be a problem for a later date, maybe after you've died of old age, you know, like the grandchildren deal with the problem or something. It's fine. <laughs> Yeah, see, I never knew anything like that. That's great. Okay, while Tyrion Lannister is certainly one of the best characters in Game of Thrones, if Game of Thrones was historically accurate, do you think Tyrion would have really been raised as a Lannister, or do you think he would have been left in the woods as a changeling baby? So, when it comes down to uh, disabled people, such as uh, Tywin, 
Ty was it Tywin or Tyrion? I keep mixing them up. Tywin. Ty yeah, that one. The short one, Lannisters, and the um, people who are disabled in medieval society. Uh, basically, I mean, although there are instances when you look at things like ancient Greece, there are a lot of references, especially in plays, to people being sort of, you know, like for example, Oedipus Rex, who were left to die out basically on the mountains and in forests and areas like that, just, you know, if they were seen as disabled children, and that would be it. But when you look at things like medieval society, I don't really see any references to that happening in particular. Uh, normally it looks like, actually, they'd be looked after and cared for, especially by monks. You'd have institutions, especially when you see the development of hospitals as Christian institutions, who'd be basically sort of looking after the poor, so they'd be finding people who were impoverished, trying to give them food, to try to find homes for the homeless, and part of their sort of Christian duty of care that they saw, you know, as their sort of, as part of their life as a monk, would actually include giving care whatever's needed to people who had disabilities, illnesses, and even things like mental illnesses as well. Um, quite weird, they actually was just having a look in terms of specific illnesses. Obviously, apart from leprosy was an obvious one. Uh, there were mentions I was seeing online about apparently the glass illness, where people would feel they were fragile, and that if they, you would touch them and they would fall apart. Now, I don't know, it's something I just saw quickly, so I can't confirm the validity of that, but there were certainly, of course, just as in all time periods, a variety of physical and mental illnesses sometimes present from birth, and people like monks in their institutions would be able to, well, and actually would see it as their duty, to look after people with illnesses and disabilities, especially when you look at peasants and commoners who might not be able to you know, afford or have the ability to care for the other members of their family instead. That's great information. I didn't know any of that either. All right, last question. If Khal Drogo and his son had survived and Daenerys' original plan had gone off without a hitch, and assumedly if Khal Drogo did live, then the dragons would have never hatched, do you think the lords and commoners of Westeros would have accepted this regime change? If the Dothraki people are seen as these dangerous savages and they came to fight civilization, how do you see that playing out? Would the Dothraki stand a chance against a modern military? And do you think the people would allow barbarians to swoop in and permanently alter their way of life? Now, when it comes down to looking at people like the Dothraki and people who were going against, as you say, a more modern military, it's an interesting one. They could actually stand the chance, and well, the usual situation that would happen, especially when you look at older uh, situations like with the Celts, for example, and their sort of tactics against the Romans, you wouldn't really see people just bringing up armies. Well, I mean, you could. They could bring up armies to go directly against the sort of more highly developed and more modern military. But what would typically happen is they'd just get completely squashed. There'd be fewer numbers quite often. They'd have inferior sort of weapons and armour. Their tactics would be not very good. Their fighting styles might only specialise in a particular way. Whereas with more broad experience, the excuse me, more sort of imperialistic army would actually have a wide range of experience against different types of styles. So in that situation, they'd just die off very quickly. But there is still a way, and that would normally be by guerrilla warfare. So going around in the areas, making sure to sort of sneak up and ambush small patrols, and just look at doing things like cutting off the supply lines and weakening very gradually the, uh, the enemy army, until it gets to the point where they're in a pretty bad situation. But it can't go on forever, the guerrilla warfare can't just continue forever because all they'd ever be doing is just harassing and causing a disturbance to these armies. They'd still be able to stay in their cities, they'd still be able to fortify, they'd still be able to enforce their laws and basically own the place. But what they can do is, when they've weakened the military by attacking the supply lines by harassing their, well, doing things like harassing the local villages and places that they control, looking at things like perhaps burning important structures or even actually cut, you know, attacking and killing certain smaller armies and patrols as opposed to going for the main army. And then, once they've done that hit, that actually weakens the army significantly, at that point they go in for the killing blow. 
they go for a decisive battle that's a proper large-scale pitched battle with all they've got against the imperialistic army who they're up against and basically then try to win. And one of the important things is when you get things like smaller skirmishes and guerrilla tactics, they start to learn more and more from the enemy. So like you see with the Celts, you see the example of the Battle of Teutoburg Forest. So not only were they just people who knew the landscape, they are people who were able to cause ambushes and get everything perfectly set up for that one battle, but they also knew what the enemy were going to do. They'd studied them, they'd fought in small-scale skirmishes, they'd seen the way they'd fought maybe from other battles, not necessarily taking part, but just scouting, and seeing what they do in those particular situations, perhaps even detaching small skirmish units against the large army, going in, seeing what they do in reaction, and then going away again. That has been done, like for example, uh, Saladin versus Richard the Lionheart in the Crusades. That was another example where they'd have small skirmishes going against the large army and studying exactly what the enemy are doing. And then once they have all of that information, they've prepared the supplies, the tactics, they've rallied the troops, they've got lots from the surrounding countryside and from their original places. Once that's all been set up, then they go in for that final decisive blow. And that's how they'd win. But if they just through themselves, and unfortunately, I'm, I hate to sound like a pessimist, but I imagine that's what they'll probably do in Game of Thrones, they'll just throw them up against the more advanced army, and if that's the case, in real life, they, they just get squashed. It's like, the, it's like one of the reasons why I always think that the why in the situation of, sort of knights versus samurai, although they have very similar weapons and equipment, I personally would go in favour of the knight. Why? Is it biased towards Europe because I'm from there? Probably to a degree, but more importantly, there's the fact that they have a broader range of experience. The Europeans, in the case of knights, they have been able to go against other people from the rest of Europe. They've been going to places like the Middle East, they've gone sometimes further east. It, you get different situations, they have fought in a variety of situations and contexts. Whereas people like the samurai have mostly fought against each other. And in that situation, we are back to the same scenario again, where people who are smaller scale, not as developed, will be used to fighting their own kind, usually a more sort of tribal warfare, like in the case of the people we're talking about. But the more developed armies would have a wide range of experience. They'd be used to fighting that type of enemy and other types of enemies as well. So they would be less surprised by new tactics. This has been so awesome, Jonathan. Thank you so much for coming on today. Again, Jonathan's channel is PC Genie, and I've got a link in the description below. Please go check him out. He's got tons of awesome stuff. And I guess that does it for my questions today. So thank you again, Jonathan, for coming. And thank you everyone for watching, and we'll see you later. Yeah, I might be overthinking it, but that's literally my job. Well, that's all I have for now, but this video's not quite over yet. We're expanding, so I have to plug our other channels. Total, we have The Fangirl, dealing primarily with movies and shows, Say Halo Goodbye Gaming, and The Family Family Vlogs. Links are in the description, and we would love to see you at all three channels. Okay, I think that's it. So thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed enough to like, subscribe, and share this video. We have tons of material across our various channels that you are fully encouraged to go check out. And if somehow you can't get enough of me, please connect with me on Instagram at say hello goodbye or Twitter at the underscore family. 